All right. So our next presenter, we have two presenters coming up next. And they are Anthony and Spencer, who will be presenting on the possibilities of interstellar travel. Everyone see that? All right, perfect. Okay, all right, I will turn it over to you guys. Um, and it should, when each of you speak, the camera should rotate to each of you when you speak. So um, if there's any problems, I'll let you know. Okay, right. thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our presentation on the possibilities of interstellar travel. In our capstone project, we tried to envision what a real life space mission across the universe would actually look like. My name is Spencer O'Patterny, and this is Anthony Eppolito, and we hope to explain to you how we think mankind could travel to the stars. Scientists around the world have searched hard for decades for extraterrestrial life, but today, Anthony and I are going to introduce you to the first aliens, ourselves, humans from Earth. The year is 2196, and humanity is on the brink of extinction. Like climate experts had warned for decades, the world could not sustain its level of carbon emissions. People wear masks on the streets in cities of smoke-filled skies. New York City is flooded from rising sea levels. Storms, floods, droughts, and wildfire fires are the new normal across the world. Wildlife populations have steadily declined and millions of species have gone extinct. People live in fear. Now, this may seem a bit dramatic from today's point of view, but climate experts predict 150 years from now, our Earth as we know it may not be able to sustain human life. And even if we were to make drastic changes right now, we would still see a large increase in average global temperature. Currently, we are living in the middle of the sixth mass extinction event, as hundreds of species die out every year. While global warming is one of the most studied dangers to our species, climate is not the only possible extinction scenario. They may be scary to think about, but nuclear warfare, asteroid impacts, or global pandemics, much like the one we so clearly see the consequences of today, are very real possibilities. Whichever way you want to spin it, there will almost certainly come a day in which we humans have to get creative to find a way to preserve our species. Anthony and I propose that we look to the stars. To reach our destination, we will have to build the biggest, most advanced rocket ship of all time, far more impressive than the Starship Enterprise or the Millennium Falcon. We must carry a colony of 500 passengers to a galaxy far from our own and surpass the mountain of challenges that we will face along the way in order to save our species. While the classic pencil-shaped rocket ship is widely used in today's spacecrafts, for a journey as far as our own, we will look to use a drum-shaped ship, as shown on the screen. Coming in at one kilometer in diameter, the Tony Spence Star Galactica is fully equipped for an interstellar journey. The outer ring revolves at a speed of over 150 miles per hour, and passengers will stand on the inside of the outer edge of the ring, taking advantage of the centripetal force provided by the spinning of the rings to experience artificial gravity. Think of a bucket of water spinning in a circle. The water stays inside the bucket because of centripetal force. This gravity force is how our astronauts will maintain their fitness and avoid becoming space noodles. Inside the ring, the center of the core of the ship holds the fuel for the entire journey and will propel the drum through the stars. For this mission, we must use an incredibly energy efficient fuel source, one that's far better than anything we have access to in today's age. Instead, we must use the technology of the future. Therefore, we ask you to bear with us as we venture into the world of theoretical physics mixed with a bit of science fiction. We considered light sails, black hole drives, and Alcubierre warp drives. Right now, it seems like the fuel of the future will be nuclear, but even nuclear bombs may not be good enough for us to reach our destination outside of the solar system. And so we looked even further into the future and chose to use antimatter propulsion for our engine. Normal matter is what makes up everything we see around us. Matter is described as anything that has mass and takes up space. Basically, matter is just stuff. Antimatter is a sort of mirror matter to normal matter. It also has mass and takes up space. However, whenever antimatter comes into contact with normal matter, they completely annihilate one another in an enormous burst of energy. This property makes antimatter extremely difficult to store, produce, and control, but the mass of energy it releases also makes it extremely efficient. The production cost and its difficulty to contain are the main reasons why engineers today don't consider antimatter fuel when designing a rocket ship. However, if these obstacles could be overcome, 
Antimatter would surely be the fuel of choice for an interstellar rocket ship in the future. The fuel is so efficient that one M&M sized piece of antimatter mixed with one M&M would carry the same amount of energy as 80 kilotons of a nuclear weapon. Just 10 grains of salt sized antimatter mixed with 10 grains of normal salt would emit the same amount of energy as 6 million pounds of rocket fuel. Nuclear fusion, which is considered very effective, only converts about 1% of its rest mass into energy. Antimatter could reach close to 100%. With this efficiency, well under 100 pounds of antimatter would be enough to reach the final destination. To store antimatter, scientists right now are studying the use of magnetic fields. Today, only several atoms of antimatter can be stored with the current technology. However, every year, improvements are made in the amount of particles that can be stored, and we believe storing it will be possible by the time our journey takes off in 2196. Another large problem is controlling the energy of the annihilation. So far, Ryan Weed, leading antimatter scientist and CEO of Positron Dynamics, has developed a moderator that can control antimatter particles through magnets. His moderator can control the energy of the blast and convert it into gamma ray energy that can then be directed onto charged particles. These charged particles will follow magnetic field lines and therefore, this principle could be used to direct annihilation energy behind the ship to create thrust. Finally, once we have our fuel secured, the inside of the ship must be designed. One possibility is to have cryogenic sleep chambers in which passengers can be out of consciousness for the entire journey and wake up shortly before they arrive. Another possibility is to make the ship more lively in which spe special biomes could be designed inside the ship so that humans can grow their own food and even bring along some animals from Earth as a sort of Noah's Ark. Recently, we were reading the novel Aurora by acclaimed sci-fi author Kim Stanley Robinson, which features a ring-shaped spaceship much like our own, designed to travel outside the solar system. In, this, in the book, their ship holds around 2,000 people, all divided into 24 different biomes, acting almost as countries. For us, this approach means we can keep everyone happy and take along different animals and plants to populate our new planet when we get there. Similarly, besides getting rid of cabin fever, we must make sure we take all the necessary resources on our long journey. Everything used, from drops of water to breaths of air, must be reused and recycled. We were fortunate enough to interview naval architect John Tressel, and he explained how starships and submarines are actually very similar and share many of the same features. In both, you have to survive with limited outside contact for very long periods, meaning the passengers have to do everything themselves. Far out in space, this becomes exponentially more important. There aren't any gas stations to stop for a repair. Now that we have our rocket ship, we have to choose where to go. The fate of humanity rests in this crucial decision. Everything is about water. If we go to a planet too hot, all the water will burn up. Too cold, and the water will freeze. We need to find a planet within what's called the habitable zone, or just the right distance from the orbiting star, where liquid water can exist. When finding exoplanets, meaning a planet outside of our solar system, scientists sometimes look for a wobble in the star's light. These are caused by orbiting planets and their gravitational effect on the star, and it's also how scientists estimate the mass of the planet. The bigger the starlight's wobble, the heavier the, the nearby planet. Outside of our solar system, the closest star is located in the Alpha Centauri system, specifically Proxima Centauri. It is a mere 4.22 light years from Earth, or almost 25 trillion miles away. If Earth was shrunk down to the size of the head of a pin in Guilford, Connecticut, our ship would be just a bit bigger than a water molecule, and Proxima Centauri would be another pin somewhere off the coast of Japan in the Pacific Ocean. This may seem like a long distance, but space is mind-bogglingly big. The next closest star with habitable exoplanets is over 13 light years away. The Alpha Centauri solar system consists of a binary pair, two stars which orbit each other every 80 years, and a third star, Proxima Centauri, or Proxen for short. This is where our rocket will be going. This star is a red dwarf, making it considerably smaller than our own sun. So far, there is one confirmed exoplanet, Proxima Centauri b, orbiting Proxima Centauri, and this is where our mission will go to. This may be humanity's new home. It was discovered very recently in 2016 and has given scientists optimism both for finding potential alien life and for an expedition in the distant future, much like this one. 
It has a radius about 1.1 times bigger than the Earth's, and a mass 1.17 times the Earth's mass, which amazingly was confirmed less than three weeks ago by a new and improved measurement spectrograph in Switzerland. This increased size and mass means people are 0.3% heavier there than on Earth. Its surface temperature is slightly colder than Earth's, but like our home planet, Proxen B is a, is a warm, Earth-sized, rocky planet capable of holding liquid water and therefore harboring life. It is most likely compo composed of metals and rocks called silicates, consisting of iron, nickel, sulfur, and other combinations that humans can eventually harvest for natural materials. As you can see, the Earth's similarity index on the right, the exoplanet's likeness to Earth, is very comparable at 87%. However, because Proxen is a dwarf star, its habitable zone is much closer, meaning Proxen b revolves at only 1 20th the distance between the Earth and Sun. Despite the close proximity, Proxen and Earth still receive similar amounts of light and radiation from their nearby stars. Although, this does mean that a year on the exoplanet, or one revolution, is actually only about 11.2 Earth days. The planet might also be tidally locked, like our moon, meaning one side of the planet always faces the star. This would give it a hot side and a dark side, but with the help of a warm ocean circulating heat across the planet, it should be fine. Finally, Proxen B presents one last challenge to our future passengers. All stars have solar flares, or strong bursts of solar energy, and this star is no exception. Because the planet and star are so close, these flares can be deadly and actually thin the atmosphere of the planet, allowing harmful radiation to come to any inhabitants. For example, a solar event was observed which re released about a quarter of the energy released from a hydrogen bomb detonated on the surface of Proxen B. The flare itself reportedly made the star 68 times brighter. Observers think that these, that these large solar flares are rare. But nevertheless, this influx of radiation might be something the future humans have to adapt to. If we can't overcome this, there is hope in the form of a potential second exoplanet around Proxima Centauri. Although not officially confirmed yet as a planet, Prox Sen C would be what's called a super-Earth, about six times more massive than the Earth and very icy, although still in the habitable zone. Like Jupiter's moon Europa, if Prox Sen C exists, there could be life underneath the oceans of ice. For now, our mission's final destination will still be Proxima Centauri b. The trip to the planet will be long and challenging, and our future interstellar astronauts need to be prepared. Our spaceship needs to travel 4.22 light years. Remember, one light year is the distance light travels in a year at a speed of 300 million meters per second. This distance is about 270,000 AU. One AU is the distance between the Earth and the Sun. Although we don't really have to worry about hitting asteroids, space is not entirely empty. In the interstellar medium, there are many sp small particles of space dust, mainly hydrogen atoms, that at extremely high relativistic speeds could prove deadly to the ship and our passengers in a collision. And of course, long-term exposure to the cosmic radiation leads to cancer. So while our trip needs to be as fast as possible, these space dust particles actually set our speed limit. NASA propulsion and rocket scientist Mark Millis estimates ships can travel no faster than 50% the speed of light without the space dust killing the passengers. At this speed, a colliding dust particle of only a few milligrams releases the same amount of energy as a 10-gram bullet traveling at 930 miles a second. 50% light speed is a ridiculously fast speed at 150 million meters per second, way faster than anyone has ever gone before. For comparison, Voyager 1, the fastest man-made craft, is only going about 17,000 meters per second. However, with our antimatter engine, the speed is theoretically doable and greatly transforms this interstellar journey from one that spans generation to one that just takes eight years. Our proposed mission is separated into three stages. The first, where we start from Earth and accelerate to half the speed of light, the second, where we travel most of our journey at our maximum speed, and the third, where our rocket decelerates to rest on the surface of Proxima Centauri b, 4.22 light years away. In stage one, our rocket leaves home and accelerates away from Earth at 1 g, 9.8 meters per second per second. This means every second, our speed increases by 9.8 meters per second. Humans can only experience high g's for a short period of time, but at only 1 g, 
the ride is very comfortable and sustainable by our antimatter engine. It takes us about 177 days to reach 50% light speed, which is a pretty remarkable feat. Over this time, we travel 7,667 AUs in less than 3% of our voyage. Going back to the pinhead scale, we would only be a few hours from Guilford by car, somewhere in the middle of Pennsylvania. We still have a long way to go. Stage two is where things get interesting. Thanks to our extremely fast relativistic speed and Einstein and his theory of special relativity, time actually passes differently on board the ship than back on Earth. In fact, it passes more slowly, meaning the trip seems to take less time to everyone on board. Most of our mission takes place during stage two, and the rocket travels over 250,000 AU at a constant speed. At half light speed, time dilation is noticeable. And while to a non-moving perspective, say back on Earth, stage two takes about eight years, on board the ship, it only takes about 6.9 years. After stage two is over, the passengers are about 340 days younger than everyone back on Earth. Finally, our mission will enter stage three, where we decelerate from half light speed all the way to rest, meaning our journey to Prox NB is over. Once again, decelerating at 9.8 meters per second, per second, this takes a little over 177 days. All in all, the trek takes, from the perspective of the travelers, seven years and 315 days. Of course, although we didn't mention it, time dilation does occur during the accelerating and decelerating phases. But this involves general relativity and tensor calculus, and the mathematics are outside of the scope of this project. Just know that those traveling in the rocket would be considerably younger when they arrived at Prox B than if they stayed on Earth. After passing Mars in, in our journey, we first come to the asteroid belt found between Mars and Jupiter, about 500 million kilometers away from Earth. Unlike in Star Wars, the asteroid belt is relatively harmless. Although there's millions of rocks, some miles across, they are found over half a million miles apart on average. As we fly past the orbits of the gas giants, we meet the Kuiper Belt, another asteroid field and home to Pluto, Pluto everyone's favorite exoplanet, about 20 AUs past Neptune. This one is far bigger, 20 times as wide as the asteroid belt. Well, though we're past the traditional solar system now, we're still in what's called the heliosphere. The heliosphere, defined as the outermost limit of the charged particles ejected from our sun, extends for 80 AU in total. After crossing this border, our rocket is officially in the interstellar medium, although the sun's gravity is still significant for another 100,000 AU. At Voyager 1's current speed, it will take that spacecraft 30,000 years to cross this area, known as the Oort Cloud. But for our ship, it will take only about 40 years. Don't forget to look out the window. Finally, after a lot of planning and years of space travel, our rocket lands on Proxima Centauri B after only eight years. This is all assuming we can set up a space colony, which I understand is a big if, but that is a story for another time. For now, the human race is safe. Of course, Spencer and I hope we never have to leave Earth and travel to the stars for any reason other than curiosity. In this day and age, it's important to take care of the Earth and trust in science so that we can do everything possible to avoid a mass extinction like the one we talked about here. We would like to take time now to thank Mrs. McDonald for giving us the opportunity to do this capstone, Mr. John Tressel for providing us with an engineering perspective and valuable insight to our rocket, and of course, Mr. Rosnick and Mr. Cooksey, our biggest supporters throughout the whole process. Thank you all for coming. We hope you enjoyed this as much as we did. We will now open the floor to questions. Wow, <laughs> you guys did an amazing job. Very impressive. Thank you. Thank you. So um, for those of you tuning in, um, you can use the chat feature to make comments and questions. And our first one is from Mr. Maseni. When the two of you begin your career as intergalactic scientists and you need a retiree to add your first mission flight passenger list, you can call on me. Landing <laughs> at a younger age certainly interests me. Both of you have mirrored the vision that we have had for Capstone that we brought to our high school. You have used your learning experience from the classrooms combined with inquiry, research, passion, and produce for a spectacular presentation. I could absolutely echo that comment. This is really what Capstone is all about. You guys did an incredible job. 
Thank you so much, well, Mr. Thank Masenti. Thank you so much. That means a lot. It really means a lot to us. This is from Susan Merkel Ward. Great job. How do I book a seat? Any thoughts about using another planet, asteroid as a way station, Mars? Yeah, well, actually, in the book we mentioned, Aurora, they used, they used a, um, I forgot what they called it, but they kind of like, uh, there was a station set up on Saturn to kind of slingshot them into, uh, into the interstellar medium. So I, I think that's definitely a, a big possibility. I think it'd be very helpful, you know, as our, as we advance we, and we hope to colonize the solar system, I think it'd be great to set up stations everywhere. And then we have a great presentation. Go Spencer, I'm so proud of you. <laughs> uh, what happens if people die on the trip? How would you dispose of the bodies? <laughs> I, saw, I saw that was from my Uncle Matt. Interesting <laughs> question. Um, we didn't really think about this, but I guess um, if you're out in space, you could probably create some kind of a space ritual unless by uh, ejecting the bodies into space. I don't know. It's uh, something we didn't really want to think about, I guess. <laughs> I don't think we want to think about that. Um, this is for Mr. Rosnick. Wait, how fast do you have to spin the ship to make it feel regularly, regular gravity? How did you calculate that? So um, thanks to Mr. Rosnick, our physics teacher, we learned some calculations about centripetal force. I have them in the, in the background here, but they're, they're pretty hard to see. So um, we had to calculate to make the, the center seeking force equal to the, the force of gravity on our, on our own Earth, so they would feel like they're, they can still stand on the ground firmly. And uh, the ship would have to spin about 150 miles per hour to, uh, to achieve this. Good answer. Um, this is from Jason. Fantastic job to you both. You clearly did a lot of hard work and research. You still made it easy to understand. How much do you think this would cost? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, well, I don't know. Uh, as we know right now, antimatter, the main source of our mm -hmm. energy, is very, very expensive to make, if it's even possible. Right now, it currently isn't possible to make more than beyond, like, only a couple milligrams. So I don't know, we'd be talking probably in the, the billions at least, trillions. Oh, of no, beyond that, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think you might even think beyond the quadrillions, I don't know. Yeah. All, a lot of money into this one. <laughs> so. Um, all humans seem to have a hard time getting along here on Earth. How will you take care of social challenges? Are you bringing any therapists with you? <laughs> It's a great question. Uh, well, we had our our model here of our spaceship, kind of just a mock-up, but you can see we got the the football stadium on board. We have some some water activities, a city. So um, our main goal with this picture is just to kind of say that they would have to have a lot of things to keep them entertained, so they wouldn't have to fight each other. <laughs> and if all else fails, we can just put them to sleep, I guess. So. Yeah, in our cryogenic sleep chambers. You guys really thought of everything. It, I mean, the, the creativity, the detail is, is unbelievable. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cooksey, so once you arrive at the destination, how are you going to create the agriculture, water resources, and infrastructure to create a hab habitual, habitual planet? <laughs> I think that might require its own presentation. I don't know if we have the time. That's a, that's a lot to do. But we tried to take as many people, as, as many important people as we could on our journey. You know, within the 500, maybe we'd have 100, you know, uh, biologists, chemists, and then we'd have the politicians and lawyers and stuff. I don't know. It'd be hard. And Mr. Masani says, create a school. Because <laughs> you need him on this. Of course. I, I'm, I would like a ticket, too. <laughs> um, tell us kind of what stemmed your interest in this. Any sort of knowledge that you've had prior, classes that you took? Well, uh, I, was, I was watching Zofia's presentation for a little bit before I got in, and she was talking about how she used her project as a kind of um, experiment on life. 
And uh, me and Anthony have always really loved math and science, and we we've, we've kind of looked up to scientists and engineers. So we we figured why not put that into practice and see what we can see what we learn, how we enjoy it, and then maybe if we want to move on with it in the future. Exactly. I think I know I speak for both of us when I mean we. I've always imagined uh, going outside, leaving Earth, you know, as an astronaut, and I've, I've always wondered, you know, how far can humans really go? And I, I mean, obviously this is theoretical, but I think it's just cool to see and to experiment with this like, as a thought experiment. Absolutely. Let's see if we have any other great work then from Mr. Cooksey. We could all echo that. So any next steps for you guys? Future plans in regards to this? Uh, well, I guess college is next for us and um, yeah. future uh, deeper studies into some of these specific areas. And I, I may be interested in doing a, another capstone sometime in the future. I enjoyed this. Yeah, yeah this was really fun. Good. And Mr. Rosnick says he wants a space colony presentation. So that could be... <laughs> No, you guys did a great job. This really um, shows what Capstone is all about. Um, creativity, out, thinking outside the box, working together. You guys did a nice job working together on this project throughout the whole semester. And you really, it flowed very nicely with both of you on. So we're really, really impressed. Well done. Thank you. Thank you.